How's everything going? Going well. Great. Very well. I'm very happy. Um, and I, sh we should talk very briefly. Uh, heads up on the term project. Um, I should be releasing soon. When I when I put something on Stellar, do you get an email about it? No. Okay. So I will try to make it work that way. Thank you for the tip. This is my first time using Stellar. And um, so I will be uh, distributing a document that describes the term project. Uh, heads up, it is <clears throat> identical to the weekly analysis assignment, except for a few things. Instead of 120 words slash one minute, more or less, or one minute max, um, it will be uh, 600 words slash five minutes max. Uh, it will involve uh, looking at uh, sources um, and naming those sources in a bibliography. And it will uh, start, uh, the first step in the process will be to choose an image. Notice that I didn't say the first step in the process is to um, uh, choose a topic or a thesis. It starts with the evidence. So you may or may not have an opinion about a specific site or a specific example. You may only have an intuition or an intuitive sense. Something came up in the lecture in passing that sparked your interest as being something worth digging into. Uh, or, and we haven't talked much about uh, the textbook, as we move back in time, this textbook becomes an increasingly vital tool for success in the class. Uh, in the 20th century, in more recent periods, uh, it's much more speculative uh, and uh, less central, perhaps. Uh, but as we move back in time, Look, as you address the term project, look at the uh, textbook and see what is in there that you might find of interest. But the thing I'm trying to emphasize here is you start with an intuition of something you might be interested in, whether it's um, Bangkok or um, industrial buildings uh, of the early modern era in South America, or slave ships, or something that you look ahead in the syllabus, look at the topics, and see what sparks your interest. But uh, that's the intuition, the historical intuition. Now look for evidence. Try to find an image uh, uh, that will support a deep visual analysis. Uh, and one of, this is one of the hardest things, although it's getting better every week uh, as the visual resources of the internet uh, become richer and richer, and hopefully it will continue in that direction. As history shows, no guarantees. Watch out for the shutting down of the internet. Um, but for now, it seems like it's expanding, and we are getting higher resolution materials uh, that is uh, an embarrassment of riches for those of us who used to dig through vertical files and libraries and actually apply for grants so we could fly to places to look in their archives. Um, it is a whole new world. So what visual resources are available to you uh, to support a deep visual analysis as the primary point of a term project? Um, and so, uh, heads up on that, the image selection is crucial, and um, s stay tuned for the official uh, assignment to coming out uh, at a website near you soon. Okay, any questions about that? Now you'll notice on the quiz and on the weekly analysis and on the term project and in the lectures, we really love exemplification. Uh, what does architecture do uh, to uh, us as bodily experiential beings when we move through space? Uh, how does it structure our experience? 
Now, it's really important to control your verbs when you talk about this. Uh, if you are saying it forces us, if you're saying it makes us or it requires, these verbs are very strong. We will see a very uh, historically prominent example today where that is the right verb. It is uh, architecture of compelling, of forced, uh, and when we get to slavery it will be similar. But in most examples that we're working with, a much softer verb choice is appropriate. It influences. It uh, alters our perception. It favors. It supports these directions or that. Individual choice and agency tends to be maintained. You can buck the, the, the tide of this architecture. Uh, at any point, at any time, one or more of you can choose to stand in this lecture hall, not sit. And you can sit or stand anywhere you want in the room, but we tend, the architecture influences you in association with the institutional arrangements uh, of education. It favors, it supports you sitting there and not talking. So um, this is an example of how the softer verbs might be more appropriate, uh, while individual agency is maintained. So um, today, we have the wonderful privilege of uh, looking at the nation state. And uh, the importance of the nation state is for several reasons. One is at the core of this course right in the title a global history of architecture, the reason we use that word global is because we're distinguishing it from prior, no, note taking, that's what I want, from prior histories of architecture, which tend to be very forcefully structured by the nation state. And like fish, who, as I mentioned, don't talk much about water to each other, they don't think about water because water is ubiquitous. They can't even tell that there's water because they do not know any condition other than water. There is no no water in their existence. We recently uh, have greater access to the condition of not my nation state. We travel more, uh, we move, we migrate, uh, and we have access to other places and other languages. Um, I don't think it's, maybe, I don't know what's happening globally, language-wise, but we have this magic machine that translates websites uh, instantaneously. Uh, we're moving in the direction of the global, the non-nation state. And there are two conditions of the non-nation state. There is the supra-nation state in which we exist moving uh, freely between nation states something that we had more access to in the 19th century than we do now with borders and terrorist uh, security prevention. And um, then there's another non-nation state, which is those communities that choose to withdraw from the nation state system. They withdraw up into the hills, and they are becoming extremely rare now. But for most of human history, they were the only game in town they have never gone away. Some of us believe they never will completely go away, despite the best efforts of the nation state as a global institution. Um, they will always be some holdouts somewhere in the jungles of New Guinea and the Amazon. But uh, increasingly, we are looking at a future uh, that moves beyond the nation state as the primary dominant institution. Ulrich Beck, the sociologist who died, I think, last year, but who uh, was a frequent visitor to Cambridge, uh, theorized this very clearly, um, that the nation state is, to a large extent, a cloaking device that prevents us from understanding the actual histor historical forces at work. And it's certainly true in architecture, where uh, the tradition of this course, taught all over the world, is first and foremost, we are citizens of whatever fill-in-the-blank nation state we happen to be situated in, United States, Italy, uh, Brazil, um, Bangkok, I mean Thailand, whatever it might be. And then secondarily, we peek across those borders at other nation states. Thus, the architecture of some 
societies which no longer have a contemporary equivalent in the nation state turn invisible and they start to get erased from the historical record. Um, so uh, there is a, a recent moving away from the dominance of the nation state. In China, the city uh, becomes more important than the nation in a lot of ways uh, that Ulrich Beck has theorized. But also prior to the period of the nation state, uh, there were empires and there were spheres of influence and there were city states. There were different institutional arrangements that offered quite viable organizational strategies as alternatives to the nation state prior to its rise very recently. So in a way, the nation state uh, might possibly be a brief blip on the larger historical screen. Um, and uh, we'll see. But in the meantime, how do we talk about the nation state if it's like wa the water we swim in? Uh, how do we develop a language? Well, one way to do it is to look at nation states uh, that were formed at a specific moment of history. Here we see, we'll, we'll get to this. I'll, I'll, um, let's move back. And our first example is uh, in Taipei, currently in the nation state of Taiwan. We used to call it China as opposed to the People's Republic of China or Red China. Um, but now we call it Taiwan, and this is evolving over time because of the interplay of nation states. But the moment we're looking at here, it's not China, it's not Taiwan. It is Japanese territory. Uh, and this is the governor general, the Japanese governor general's uh, headquarters, uh, now the presidential palace of Taiwan. Now, does it look Japanese? Does this look Japanese? It depends on what you mean by Japanese, because there was a very strong process of Japaneseization, if I can say that. There's probably a Japanese word. Is anyone from Japan? Does anyone speak Japanese? Has anyone been to Japan? Great. Been to Japan. We'll settle for that. So. Uh, there's probably a Japanese word uh, for Japaneseization, I suspect. Um, that'd be interesting to look into. But uh, this was the headquarters, and this building played a role in establishing the Japanese ownership and domination of what had been Formosa. Prior to that, uh, there was an indigenous term. The Portuguese were here. The Dutch were here. Uh, um, exerting various degrees of control. We'll get into that. But uh, this building was built by competition in two stages, 1906 um, and then 1910. And uh, the jury was dissatisfied. They awarded a winning uh, the, the contract um, to a winner. But they said, your tower is way too meek. It needs to be much taller. And so they expanded it from six to ten stories. The corners needed to be stronger and exert, uh, express a stronger uh, fortified nature, both in terms of its expression and its function, uh, because it needed to be a defensible headquarters. And they placed it at the end of this long axis to uh, give it this axial power facing east, which is uh, symbolically very important uh, to, in the Shinto uh, national religion of Japan. Um, and uh, so you have this presentation on the landscape as a very clear exemplification. Uh, just like uh, we've seen previously, these long axial views through the urban fabric have a way of exemplifying power, demonstrating in a very clear experience to all who might have any, uh, any doubt as to the power of the Japanese, and now the president, uh, lest it be... Uh, lost on uh, the audience, this is power at work, every day, all day long, subconsciously structuring, not forcing, but structuring the agency, the independent agency of the citizens, both of colonial, uh, the colonial period and currently to the present. And so you see this early presentation. It was very important to the Japanese to exude a European superiority over the indigenous populations of Asia. Um, and this 
is the system associated with this example. This example allows us to speak very clearly about how European styles of architecture and European thought is deployed widely across the globe with, for very specific and powerful uh, impact. Um, and uh, very clearly in, uh, in this uh, example. Um, the interior is uh, very clearly referencing a Baroque past that we will learn more about as we dig deeper in history. The centrality, the symmetry, we're going to be seeing this throughout the lecture, um, this power that is exemplified in the sturdiness of the architecture, the references, the metaphorical references. This is also a case of reproduce with difference. So they are reproducing the Baroque from Europe, uh, which is itself a reproduction with difference of the Renaissance, which itself is a reproduction of difference since Rome, back to Greece. Welcome to the larger trajectory of the course. And the denotation that occurs on special events, um, on the facade, with the flags, with the, uh, the language imprinted, and the cultural references uh, that are assembled in front. Why would the Japanese feel, uh, what is driving this Japanese urge uh, to, uh, behind the European deployment, the deployment of this European architecture? Well, it it's, uh, is rooted, like many things in the nation state, in a moment of, of deep humiliation, uh, collective national humiliation of the Japanese, who we will learn in future weeks, uh, isolated itself from the rest of the world, in part through, through its architecture. It mostly isolated itself with the exception of uh, Dutch contact. Um, but we'll get into that. Um, abruptly, in 1853, after the Dutch were trying to open up trade relationships with Japan, to broaden the trade relationships with Japan, and serve as the conduit for that trade relationship, which was the tradition of the colonial system, uh, suddenly Commodore Matthew Perry arrives from the United States with a flotilla of gunships. And uh, he says, uh, we are here uh, on behalf of the United States and the rest of the world. We hereby declare your port open to global trade. And so this was the, um, the paradigmatic moment of gunboat diplomacy. Uh, the boats themselves were a demonstration of clear superiority uh, technologically uh, and in many other ways that came along with that uh, of the West. And so um, the, the key moment here is with the weakening of the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, we quickly have uh, the passage to um, the former emperor's family, the Meiji Restoration. It was a restoration of the Meiji dynasty, but in every other way, it was a revolution. And um, the young emperor welcomed in the forces of the West. Uh, there was uh, an aggressive embrace of technologies, uh, institutions, uh, institutional practices, uh, political practices and architectural practices that were the vehicles for all of those things. It's a package. It's not easily separated out. And so we see here a compression of the, of the history of the late 19th century with the American flag on the ship coming into the harbor. Um, and we already start to see the architectural expressions of a Western influence, um, including um, in terms of costume. Uh, of the residents. And we love these rich colors, these, these things. In the West, it's, a, it's not just a one-way exchange. Uh, this becomes um, a very big influence on the West, including Frank Lloyd Wright, who, by the way, was commissioned to uh, build the collection of prints at the Museum of Fine Arts. That one right there. And uh, this is how he first came into contact with this type of artwork, which, uh, even though it comes from this um, millennia-old tradition of Japanese aesthetics, 
uh, feels contemporary and fresh and takes uh, the, the Western world, uh, by the art world, by storm. And it's a very uh, powerful uh, influence. And part of the influence of this artwork is in architecture. At this time, in the late 19th century, uh, in Europe especially, there is this fierce debate between the classical tradition of architecture, based on the uh, columns and the architectural vocabulary of Greece and Roman architecture, the classical tradition, versus the Gothic tradition. And there were associations with secular humanism on the classic and the religious on the Gothic, but always this deep moral thing uh, that was always loaded, embedded in, in the architecture, which is something we, of course, in this course, are uh, digging very deeply into those associations. Um, oh, what was I talking about? It's just so beautiful, right? It's very distracting how beautiful it is. Well, this is what happened. In response to this debate between the classicists and the Gothic, there was a very strong response saying, hey, wait a minute, what about art for, the, for art's sake? Why can't we just have beautiful architecture? Why can't we just have beautiful textiles, beautiful paintings? Isn't it enough that it be beautiful? Does it have to be loaded with all this moral meaning? And there was this, it started in painting, uh, and then it located in a gallery in London, and it spread to wall coverings. And it was very much in parallel with the lifestyle transformations that we've seen more recently with, um, I can't remember all these catalogs, but uh, the lifestyle. Design as lifestyle, that's it. It's just fun. And so there's this celebration of the material richness of the red brick, the, in contrast with the white limestone, and setting up this aesthetic language, freely choosing, which it was the 19th century, uh, where there was this attitude this, of eclecticism in architecture, where uh, the history of architecture offers us a huge menu of possible uh, formal uh, expressions, and we pick liberally from that menu and combine them beautifully, and this is the aesthetic movement. It hasn't been well studied or documented, um, but uh, because of the, uh, this example, uh, we need to get into this history in order to understand what's happening in Japan and in Taipei. So here's the aesthetic movement in London. Now at this moment in history, the Japanese who are going through this westernization identify in the British soulmates. They are small islands off the coast of a larger potentially dominating continent. Uh, sometimes there's uh, conflict between uh, the island society and the, the mainland. Um, they had similar populations and similar geopolitical relationships. Uh, and so there was even uh, a group I heard last night at our very interesting discussion about the global um, with Mark Yarzenbeck, the, the real, the mother of the course. Um, if Vikram's the father, um, he's the mother. And uh, he shared a paper with many of us about the global and uh, one of the things that came out uh, from one of the students uh, was that, who was from Japan, was that there was a movement to try to connect in terms of genetics the Japanese stock. Why is Japanese ethnicity so different from mainland Asia? Uh, and one theory was that it's because of the Caucasian influence of the Japanese. Uh, this moment in history is filled with such um, pseudo-scientific theorizations. Um, but there is a special relationship between the British and the Japanese, and it extends to architecture. British architects go to Tokyo. Uh, young Japanese aspiring architects are sent to London, and there is this rich exchange. And from the menu of possible styles, to adopt and adapt to the Meiji Restoration mission of nation building. A very explicit attempt to say we are no longer a shogunate system, we are no longer feudal, we are a modern nation state, and the institution of the nation state 
was considered to be a prerequisite for the industrial leap uh, that the technological uh, transformations all required. And part of that package, part of that leap into the modern world was creating a landscape that embedded the language of those institutions. It was considered to be the, the instrumentation of this transformation. And so we see in the Marunouchi district of Tokyo, uh, the Londonization of the urban landscape. You see in Katsuno Kingo's Tokyo Station of 1914, uh, a direct translation of the aesthetic uh, movement. Now, I mentioned last time the slippage that occurs, that an architectural vocabulary that means one thing in one place has a way of being relocated in a new setting where the forms may be exactly the same, but the meaning <coughs> slips. And in this example, you see in the aesthetic movement a very deliberate attempt to uh, distance <coughs> architecture from any of these deeper historical meanings. The aesthetic movement was about, isn't it fun to do beautiful things? Partly under the influence of the Japanese prints that were coming in. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it fun to look at these things that are just luscious? Why can't art just be for the sake of art? Why can't architecture just be for the sake of architecture? Ironically, it goes back to Japan, and now it is all about we are the nation state of Japan. We are modern. We are players. We are the empire builders of Asia. We're not like the rest of Asia. We are different. And my friends in Indonesia uh, who refer to uh, people who look like me as a Londo, which is a slightly derogatory term for a Dutch person, also refer to the Japanese as Londos. Um, so it's, it's, it's still there. Um, that the Japanese exceptionalism matches the European exceptionalism. We have the moral authority uh, to dominate these other societies, and dominate they do. They move uh, into Formosa and take over in 1895, and the project continues uh, through the islands. They become, uh, through an alliance with uh, Great Britain, they become allies of Great Britain during World War I. And when Germany uh, uh, abdicates, uh, Japan takes ownership of the islands, the former German-controlled uh, holdings of Asia. And so, uh, we get Korea uh, being colonized by Japan and so on and um, we'll come back to the kind of map making. Now let's push pause for a second. Um, it's interesting to see the spatial representation of this map. It is very appropriate because uh, it's so different from the assumptions of map making that we take for granted that when you control a nation state, uh, you just touch it and it turns red. The whole thing turns red. Well, not so much here. It's indicating graphically that there are specific spheres of control located around ports along the coast. And there is no pretense implied in this map of uh, Japanese control of all of the brown over here all the way to this line. Now, the software of map making and the mental software of map making uh, both conspire to make such nuanced uh, spatial expressions impossible. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. We are deeply influenced by our tools and our assumptions of map making to see everything in terms of the nation state, um, proving the prior point. And so we see uh, in Taipei, we see in Seoul, uh, Korea, we could go into those examples too if we had time. Um, we see all of this uh, exuberant uh, aesthetic movement stuff. And it leads uh, to subsequent uh, consummation of the Japanese manifest destiny of controlling uh, the Pacific Rim. Uh, and so we see in 42. Um, already uh, they've taken over 
uh, in French Indochina. Uh, they've defeated the British. Uh, they've defeated the Dutch uh, in um, the Dutch East Indies. And this is the red line is the sphere of control um, at the end of uh, in the early part of 1942. It happens very quickly. Um, but we need to move on. And so we see um, in Germany, uh, again, after World War I, another humiliation. The humiliation of Germany at the end of World War I is profound. And the terms of the peace treaty, of the Treaty of Versailles, are onerous. It plunges uh, Germany into um, deep debt, uh, and struggling economically uh, to repay the war debts uh, to the victorious Allied forces. And in a way, World War I and World War II uh, is increasingly clear <coughs> simply as a single world war with a brief pause in between. Um, and that pause in between is an interesting moment to look at, especially here in Germany, where um, the response to that humiliation of World War I is to, again, as influenced by the British, especially the, um, the International Exposition of 1851 in London that we will be looking very closely at uh, in, uh, in subsequent lectures. Uh, the industrial production of England becomes a central reference point for all kinds of nations, not just Japan, but also Germany. And Germany's uh, dominance that uh, quickly comes to the fore of industrial production is not something that happens naturally. It is the result of very direct effort, partly because of this school, uh, the Bauhaus, uh, that industrial production is the foundation of national strength. And uh, it is also the technological shift and the economic and political shift that these technologies that, that go with these technologies is this spreading of the benefits that industrial production can lower the costs of well-designed items and so industrial design uh, really comes into the foreground here at the Bauhaus and the, the possibility is that art can now uh, be at the core of making a better life for everyone again it's a lifestyle thing but here it's embedded with this a mission of human progress. And so no object of everyday life is exempt from intense design scrutiny and rethinking. And it gets expressed uh, in terms of the potential of these new materials and new technologies, especially steel and glass and steel reinforced concrete. And so we see it expressed in Walter Gropius's design for the, the relocated Bauhaus uh, in Dessau, uh, where he uses the campus design as a, a showpiece and an experimentation ground uh, of the new architecture and its principles, very much in the way that we saw with uh, Villa Savoie and Corbusier and the Roby House with Frank Lloyd Wright. This complex uh, lends itself to uh, an ex analysis of how architecture exemplifies the new human condition. By separating the columns uh, from the facade, you can now fill the entire facade with glass. It's an extreme version of Corbusier's uh, free facade. It also, glass is the key to transparency of human engagement. It eliminates the feudal, it eliminates the corruption of fixed arrangements, and it coincides with the free relationship of uh, equal human beings. The elimination of the centrality and symmetry that we saw in uh, the uh, governor general's capital in Taipei and what we will see when we move to Turkey uh, is here countered by this asymmetrical composition, reminiscent of the Roby House, uh, of these uh, pinwheel forms. Uh, that we see in the configuration of the buildings, these interconnected uh, elements, these masses uh, that are freely composed artfully um, to exude this non-hierarchical set of relationships. 
And so the school um, becomes a central focal point of, uh, of these principles and their, their profusion throughout the world, in part through the pedagogy um, that we'll look at. It, the first director was Henri Vandeveld, who was famous for his Art Nouveau concept of Gesamtkunstwerk, which is um, a fancy German word uh, that indicates the sense of an integration of all the elements of art, not just the building, but the decorative aspects, the furniture, down to, and I couldn't find a good photo of this or a good image of this, but uh, he designed the robes that his wife wore uh, in order to properly fit with the architectural experience. And the Bauhaus was, in a way, a Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, it looked at every object of uh, human everyday life. And the big new object was the light bulb. Um, the German electric company hired a designer to redo its logo. Uh, and they pulled him in from uh, the corporate identity of the German uh, electric company into designing the fixtures that had previously been uh, replications of kerosene and gaslight uh, fixtures. And his challenge was to um, redesign the light fixtures appropriate to the new technologies. And that quickly extended to the turbine factory, uh, which was one of the paradigmatic buildings of uh, the period uh, that uh, it both exuded similar principles that we see later in the Bauhaus. So this is a, a precedent a couple of decades prior to the Bauhaus where he's using the curtain wall, the glass curtain wall, uh, the clear uh, structural logic of this wide span factory building. Um, and But yet this corner is a crucial moment where he is expressing the solidity, not yet ready to go all lightweight all the time, at the corners where the forces gather, which is something we'll talk about throughout the course, he is expressing a heaviness, a thickness, a solidity, uh, because it's aesthetically necessary, not because it's structurally nece necessary. So this is the other side of that corner, and it reveals that uh, it's still a lightweight framework of steel, uh, but is expressed as this massive pier. Um, and so that's one of the key exemplifications of this new spirit. Uh, during World War I, when things were shutting down, uh, Bruno Taut, uh, who is one of the heroes of this lecture, um, starts to take his architectural training and move it in the direction of, uh, of utopian visions largely inspired by the poetry of uh, Paul Schierbert, uh, the, the writings of Paul Schierbert, uh, who is seeing in glass the essence of the future uh, aspirations of humanity. Um, the clearness of the city is crucial to the uh, expansion of the human spirit and human progress um, embedded in the characteristics of this material. Uh, Bruno Taut's vision is very much inspired by the Alps, the form of the mountains, and the potentials embedded in this glass architecture uh, that Paul Schierbert is writing about. And it it's, uh, comes together in his idea for a Stadtkron, a city crown, uh, translating from the German. I should have wrote that, sorry. But it's the city crown at the center of this new urban utopia. Um, and it gets expressed throughout this period uh, in different ways uh, with the, um, the glass chain group of artists. And it, it finally takes form in the 1914 glass pavilion at the Deutsche Werkbund uh, exhibition. The Deutsche Werkbund is a, a union of industrial craftspeople and workers who are trying to uh, disseminate the possibilities of the new technologies in industrial production. And so they really are the foundation out of which the Bauhaus grows. Um, and we see Walter Gropius, who before the Bauhaus building is, is experimenting uh, in a similar vein as Mies van der Rohe, uh, what we see experimenting with glass. The play, the interplay between solidity 
and uh, the lightweight expression. Um, many of these key heroes all were working uh, inside of uh, Peter Barron's uh, office at the time when he does the AEG turbine factory, uh, including Mies van der Rohe, Corbusier, Adolf Meyer, and Walter Gropius were all working with Barons, and so that becomes the incubator for this, the, the heroes of this new period. Architecture schools throughout the world still use uh, the, the foundation system of the Bauhaus education uh, in its education. Whether we're aware of it or not, it really still exudes a very clear uh, power over uh, the, the curricula, uh, including things you might see walking through the halls on the fourth floor, uh, these paper constructions where the inherent characteristics of paper uh, limit and uh, allow at the same time uh, specific language of construction. And so uh, this sense of materiality is at the core of this movement of non uh, of this new objectivity. Uh, the idea that uh, we are freed from the subject position, which is part of why the axonometric view is favored. Uh, the human body becomes, uh, even the human body itself becomes uh, subjected to abstraction of geometric form and movement and is the basis for the, for the famous Bauhaus dances. Um, great thing to emulate when Halloween comes around. Uh, and we see here in the, um, the, the housing at the Bauhaus school an almost direct uh, connection. Um, of course, the constructivists in the Soviet Union uh, are very much, uh, there's a huge overlap. El Lizitsky, who we looked at last time, uh, becomes a very important figure at the Bauhaus, uh, holding uh, sessions outside of class off campus and having a profound influence. Um, and this eventually all comes to the United States, uh, and I'm planting the seed here for when we get to talk about Chicago. Um, here are the non-winning the non proposal by Walter Gropius and Albert Meyer for the Chicago Tribune design competition. Um, but uh, Walter Gropius uh, shows up in Cambridge, and he builds his house out in, where is that, Lincoln? Yeah. And um, gorgeous place to visit. Uh, he becomes the head of architecture at Harvard down the street where he eliminates the library because architects should not be burdened by uh, over-familiarity with the precedents of history. Architectural form needs to not reproduce uh, with difference. It needs to emerge whole uh, afresh from the implications of materiality of uh, the 20th century. Uh, and so it comes back to home here, and uh, that tradition is very much still alive and living. Um, and some of you here are in the architecture program, I believe, right? Hold up your hand if you're in architecture. Great. So you might recognize the paper stuff, yes? And, you know, now the assignment is build something with uh, wire or uh, plaster, but it's all the formal explorations come out of the, uh, the characteristics of the material itself. And then um, there's this dark moment where the nationalism of Germany, uh, based whose success is very much based in the prior humiliation of Germany uh, to continue that theme. And the Bauhaus is taken over and closed as a, um, as a place of socialist thought, um, of um, Bolshevik uh, revolutionary ideas. Which brings us to the next chapter of our journey um, where the Ottoman Empire suddenly is defeated in World War I. And here we are in this moment between the world wars. And uh, now what? Well, the answer is Turkey. And so we look at this government center uh, established um, afterworld between the two wars uh, in Ankara, the new capital. Uh, previously Constantinople, Istanbul was the center of everything, more on that later. Uh, and uh, in the post-World War I period, 
it's shifted to the seat of the revolution, as is often the case, in Ankara. And the role of the new leadership of Ankara is one of the most dramatic tales, uh, one which we owe a great deal to Sibel Bosdegan, a former uh, professor here at MIT, um, whose research uh, informs this presentation, and her class informs everything I do uh, when she was teaching here. Um, but the establishment of the nation state in opposition to the Ottoman Empire and its past, but yet at the same time, this delicate balance between rupture and continuity, which is something, if I haven't said it yet in this course, uh, it should be said now, and we'll be hearing a lot about striking that balance between continuity of the past and rupture away from the past. And it's a very delicate operation. Um, but the architecture is one of the key instruments employed by very deliberately and very consciously, very self-consciously, by the architects and political leaders of the new nation state of Turkey. And they do it with the direct assistance of a group of about 40 very influential German and Austrian architects and planners. Uh, one of whom is Clemens Holzmeister, who designs this, who wins the competition uh, for the government district. And here we see again some of those things we looked at with the uh, Japanese example. Symmetry, columns, uh, verticality. Uh, this is the same technological uh, means of construction as we see in the Bauhaus, but we see it deployed uh, in a much more conservative manner in order to exude the authority that we expect from uh, the monuments of the nation state, the monumental uh, stature, which is different from everything that came before in Anatolia slash Turkey slash Ottoman Empire. Uh, and so you see the symmetric, uh, it's very similar in spirit of the plan, not to the Bauhaus, but to the Japanese um, headquarters. You see this, this use of axial views. We'll have a whole lecture on the power of axial views uh, coming up soon. But you see these series of thresholds uh, that also define these places where rituals and ceremonies uh, of the state can be enacted. Thus, the structuring role of the architecture to structure human bodies individually and collectively that are reinforced through the rituals of state uh, pomp and circumstance, uh, and that's an essential component of the design of a proper nation-state government center. To the point where, um, in giving some details, this is an early German proposition uh, for the government center, which becomes the basis for the competition uh, that follows, uh, that is won by Clemens Holzmeister, who his capital complex is part of this larger government district that he wins with. And this building in the forefront uh, is simultaneously a triumphant arch, an arc de triomphe in the Napoleonic tradition, like you see in Paris, but also something very contemporary. Uh, but it serves the function of state architecture to frame views and to exude power and control of the perspective of participants in the rituals of the nation state. Uh, the requisite um, monument to the uh, war for independence is there centrally located as part of that ritual of commemoration. And we see here the directness with which uh, the German, this is a poster for the German <coughs> architecture exhibition of 1943, um, after the Bauhaus has kind of been displaced by this more nationalistic architecture that we will look at soon. But this very direct uh, connection between the nationalist architecture of Germany and what we see uh, coming out in Ankara, in Turkey. Now, uh, the Turkish, the, um, the Meiji Restoration Constitution that is established, part of the key instrumentation of the nation state, is based on the German Constitution. The, uh, the Turkish uh, founding documents are based on French, uh, and they, so they take their philosophy and their political ideologies from the French. They take their architecture from the Germans and the Austrians. Um, and we see here 
uh, one of the, I don't have a lot of uh, imagery to, to share uh, of the uh, vernacular, traditional Turkish architecture of the overhanging wood structures that you see in Istanbul. Uh, how many people have been to Turkey? Yay. How many people are from Turkey? All right. Um, and so you see references to that overhang. Uh, but here, spelled out in this contemporary German, very German cubic architecture. And so it takes on that name. Um, it is referred to throughout this period as a cubic architecture because of this, um, this issue uh, of the forms uh, being very much uh, coming out of the German tradition, also coming out of the Bauhaus. Um, where the government structures are very strictly uh, orthogonal and uh, symmetric and exuding of power, uh, we see, uh, as in this, this is the presidential palace, um, there it is on the hill, you see a vernacular, earlier vernacular structure in the foreground, um, but very much in the tradition of, uh, this could be in the United States uh, in the 50s, for all we know. But this is the presidential palace. Um, there's um, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the, the central figure, the authoritarian figure, who he himself makes the choice. He says, we must shed uh, this past. We must take off the fez, which is an immediate sign to the rest of the world of our own ignorance and our backwardness. We must remove the fez, we must remove the veil, we must stop putting uh, Muslim domes on every building we make, uh, and we must join the world in this march towards progress and lead the world in this march towards progress. So similar in spirit to what we saw with the Aswan Dam uh, in the early nation state of Egypt, the non-aligned movement that comes together in 55 in Bandung, and you see this march into the future, the option uh, that had been prepared for the people of uh, this area was the partition of, uh, this, of the Ottoman Empire after its defeat in World War I amongst the European uh, <coughs> victors. And so you have an Armenian zone, a Greek zone, uh, an Italian zone, uh, the British zone, and then this crucial geopolitical choke point uh, between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean of Istanbul, formerly known as Constantinople, um, this geographic hotspot on the planet uh, throughout human history, uh, becomes an international zone. And of course, the British need to have their part of it as well. Uh, so instead of that, and then what's left over is the yellow. And that's to be ruled by... Uh, these tribal groups of the former Ottoman Empire. Well, Kemal, um, um, Kemal whose name becomes Ataturk, the source of the country's name Turkey, um, establishes a set of principles of, mo of radical modernization, uh, Kemalism. He imposes it on the victorious uh, nation-state of Turkey, uh, that wins the, the fight against the uh, colonizing powers, the recolonizing powers of Europe, and they uh, take the old city at the center of Ankara, uh, centered on the citadel, and they reconceive it as a garden city extension uh, in the European uh, mode, and they even reconceive the citadel at the center of the city as a stotkron, uh, directly from Bruno Taut. Uh, idea of the, the crown of the city. Bruno Taut, interestingly, uh, sees the signs of what's happening in Germany in 32, escapes and goes to Japan, where he lives for several years uh, writing about Katsura Palace, one of our favorite places of this course. Uh, and then from Japan, conveniently enough, relocates to Ankara and Istanbul and um, uh, has a a deep influence uh, on uh, Turkish uh, architecture. So the perfect figure to tie together these examples. Uh, but we see if um, the, the sketching and drawing uh, 
method of Eric Mendelssohn, and I'm not sure why these are out of out of sequence, but Eric Mendelssohn uh, is famous for drawing these uh, thick pencil lines, and this is one of the Turkish architects testing the waters of what it would be like to, to design in a German mode of uh, drawing and design. And here we see uh, a loosening up if the German uh, government center by uh, Holzmeister is very stoic and staid and stately and authoritarian. Uh, we look at the arts and sciences uh, buildings of the university, the new health facilities, the recreational facilities, we see something much more playful, much more asymmetrical, uh, like we would see at the Bauhaus. Here we see something that um, is uh, reminiscent of uh, the prairie style of Frank Lloyd Wright. So there is, there's the one with um, drawings in the mode of uh, German modernist Eric Mendelssohn, um, where there was a very free... Uh, deployment of German architectural design traditions repurposed for something totally different. So just like the Japanese example, we have an architecture that is embedded with all kinds of meanings and uh, stories of origin in Germany, now being shifted and imported and exported, uh, it goes both ways, into a new setting where the exact same forms take on totally different meanings, where in Germany it had to do with uh, this play of form and light and color, uh, liberated both by the technologies of the modern uh, industrial explosion and the political institutions. And here we see it deployed as it's this explicit, we are not Ottoman, and this is the primary message is that of difference. We are not Ottoman, we are not traditional, we are members of the New World. And nowhere does this uh, ring more clearly than when it comes to gender politics uh, and the role of women. Um, uh, the, the foreign forces are very influential in helping the men of the former Ottoman Empire embrace a new role for women. A woman is placed at the head of the uh, Bacteriology Institute, and the building itself, which is prominently displayed in an axial street network, again a place of power, visually at the end of a corridor, um, you see the unthinkable occur, which is the portrayal of the Greek goddess uh, Hygieia uh, naked on the front of the building. And this is a profoundly Muslim society that is now being asked to uh, change, to uh, get rid of the fez, get rid of the veil, allow women to have a stronger place in society, uh, allow things to uh, change socially, and it happens through institutions uh, of education and um, through schools in particular. Here's uh, a woman, a German woman architect who is uh, designing an extension to the girls' school uh, in this very um, lovely uh, manner with plantings and of the new style, and very much uh, using architecture to forge a break with the past. Um, and we stop in with, uh, with the dam projects. Uh, this was, first and foremost, another project like the Aswan Dam that had to do with uh, signaling, or well, first and foremost, bringing agricultural uh, irrigation, electricity to the people. So very much about bringing the pragmatic benefits of the modern industrial world to the, the nation state, but also to signal, uh, very much to signal uh, that uh, Turkey is one of the players in the world. And they do so by um, developing this casino restaurant. Casino in, Mus in the Muslim world? Yes. And the architecture and the programs that go with the architecture is part of the package of radical modernization. Kamal is on a civilizing mission. And I haven't said the word civilizing mission, I don't think, before. But as we move into the colonial period, 
we will find that this sense that I am bringing human progress to the poor downtrodden masses as the justification for all kinds of stuff. And Kamal the authoritarian is very much uh, pulling this new nation state, the society kicking and screaming, uh, but pulling them successfully into a secular, modern, national existence, in part uh, through this set of package, this package of institutions uh, wrapped up in the architecture. And these things are integrated. Um, we talked about the Weisenhof Siedlungen, the housing uh, exploration, uh, experimental housing exhibition uh, run by Mies van der Rohe in Germany, in Weisenhof. Uh, very directly, a series of uh, Siedlungen uh, housing experiments using this German cubic architecture uh, proliferates um, and we're trying to give the citizens of Turkey access to light and air and nature on the ground plane. The final uh, object of our stop in Ankara is a return to the stoic authoritarian style in the um, mausoleum devoted to uh, Ataturk. Um, and one of the last things that Bruno Taut did uh, before his death in 1938 was to design um, the architecture for the transportation, uh, in the architecture in transit to move the body of Ataturk to the mausoleum. Uh, and here we see a return to this style. We could be looking at Italian architecture of the late fascist period. We could be looking uh, at Spain, but there is this proliferation. We could even be looking at the United States, but this proliferation of government-sponsored architecture that exudes this authority of a stripped-down modernist rendition of classical orders and scales and axial organization of architecture. And uh, we see that. And here's Bruno Taut's house um, at the time when he died. He was living in Istanbul. And it's hard not to see this as a kind of a Stadtkron, uh, a Stadtkron uh, for the last days of Bruno Taut's life. Moving quickly, um, we don't have a huge amount of time, to our final example. <clears throat> and I'm doing this a little differently. Um, not focusing on a single site, but on a pair of sites. Not to say parasite. Um, <laughs> but these two sites, one being um, in keeping with this theme of nation building, and the logic of the nation building uh, can, uh, can be a little scary. Uh, that the forces of nationalist pride, especially in conditions of deep humiliation can get scary. There's something about uh, embracing uh, victimization as a foundation for moving forward that leads to bad behavior, um, to state it mildly. Um, but the humiliation that the Japanese felt, the humiliation um, the, uh, of, the, of the Turks in, at the end of World War I with the unfair treaty, uh, and the humiliation of the Germans uh, with the terms of uh, the Treaty of Versailles is, is very much a part of Hitler's success. He was, uh, first and foremost, to the end, he considers himself an artist. And he wanted to be an architect. He was uh, denied entry into uh, the art architecture program at Vienna twice, um, unfortunately, because... Maybe he would have been an okay architect, or at least harmless enough, if his energies had been uh, expended that way. Instead, he gets thrown into his victimization uh, of the German people, and he writes Mein Kampf. He lays out the whole thing for the whole world to see. So no surprises what happens next, because he lays it out there in his time in prison after trying to overthrow the government of Germany. And he, cre he generates such a huge following of young victimized uh, Germans, especially the young men, that he is emboldened 
to uh, into politics. And um, and so this failed architecture student um, goes into the business of establishing an empire uh, to last a thousand years or more. Uh, and uh, job number one is to purify the stock. Um, and this is a crucial component of establishing the thousand years reign of the Third Reich. And so we see uh, the glorious um, capital building. This is the, uh, the world capital, not global capital. We weren't using the word global at that time, I guess. Uh, but the world capital, Germania, in Berlin, the transformation of Berlin. How big is Gillette Stadium? How many people does it hold? More or less. You're gonna, okay, you're gonna find that. How about Madison Square Garden? Well, just like in Dubai, in China, um, where it's important to build the biggest, longest, most something, um, this hall at the center uh, is designed to build 180,000 people. Um, and then there's a stadium that never gets uh, even built in model, I don't think, or maybe it does, that's designed to hold 400,000 people. Uh, and so the transformation of Berlin becomes one of the central instruments for the German project. 70,000 in Gillette Stadium. So Gillette Stadium, 70,000. Here, 400,000. And in this interiorized uh, uh, dome, 180,000. Um, so this is the juxtaposition of the concentration camp uh, in two sites in Auschwitz, commonly called, referred to as Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, two separate sites in Auschwitz. Um, where the industrial, the logic of industrial production is deployed here with the work of architects and engineers uh, with uh, chilling precision and effectiveness. And uh, it's complemented on the other side of this grand construction of the new German capital. And so the arched gateway, uh, the triumphal arch leading to uh, the Great Hall of the Third Reich, uh, the arched gateway of, of the rail cars coming into Auschwitz um, for extermination. The gateway over uh, the pedestrian entrance says, uh, work makes freedom. And this is very much, the connection here is with uh, the work um, that Adolf Hitler was not a successful architect, although he always wanted to be, but he needed someone else. He needed Albert Speer. Speer is an interesting character, and um, he broke the mold of the other uh, war criminals by, uh, by going against his lawyer's advice. And in the Nuremberg trials, Nuremberg trials, he said, yes, I am complicit. I am uh, guilty of all of the crimes you are speaking of, but I didn't know. And this was um, the basis uh, for a story that he constructed, I am an architect. I am a technical specialist. I solve problems. I am the consummate solve, problem solver. I don't know about politics. It has nothing to do with me. I am here to solve problems. He even claimed that he knew nothing about the concentration camps. Um, uh, history is developing, uh, is coming to a different conclusion, but uh, it's very interesting for us to look at this construction of the role of architecture because it cuts right to the core of uh, what is the role of the history of architecture. Is it just to look at, um, at these sites and these systems within the boundaries that are carefully constructed and fiercely defended to the present by architects saying, we are only about architecture. We deal with this. The stuff outside there, not our department. That's for others. Well, Speer is the quintessential moment. His, his, uh, his role in this whole thing and his testimony at Nuremberg is the moment of truth where this attitude is put on trial. Uh, and even if the jury let him off with a 20-year sentence, uh, whereas everyone, his colleagues got the death penalty, um, his 
uh, complicity in this is uh, increasingly clear as we move on. Um, and we look at the modes of industrial production uh, employed to the logic of the construction of the nation state. And these two things come together uh, through the instrumentation of the death camps. Um, there's Speer on the left, uh, someone who Hitler came to admire greatly, arguably one of his closest friends. Uh, Hitler, the failed architect, uh, greatly admiring the skill with which Speer uh, takes on challenge after challenge, staying up all night and solving the problem, uh, often with brilliance. Um, the key example is that um, as uh, when the head of German armament uh, production uh, dies uh, in 42, Hitler appoints Speer, the architect, to, to head up the effort to boost the industrial production for the war effort. And there's a shift of resources away from food and everyday needs towards the production of, of armaments, of tanks, of guns, of artillery shells. Um, and the weapons of war. And Speer, uh, even as British and Allied forces beat the hell out of the factories of Germany with its aerial bombardment, uh, Speer actually increases the production, which reaches a peak mere months before the end of the war in 1944. Uh, and so Speer is extremely effective at what he does. Uh, Himmler General Himmler um, makes a speech, uh, well, I'll get to that if there's time, but this is one of the projects early on that within one year, uh, Speer designs and executes this building of the new chancellery, uh, which so impresses everyone. Um, he claims to not have known anything about the uh, production of this facility, the ovens, um, uh, euphemistically called the crematorium um, of uh, Auschwitz, um, where the careful calculation, where the architect, some technical expert, had to measure how, how many bodies can you stack up uh, and what, what's the dimension do they take for the ultimate efficiency uh, of extermination. Um, the, the rallies, uh, another uh, human body that uh, Hitler was focused on controlling were the bodies of German citizens and the soldiers um, in these highly ritualized enactments in the context of classical architecture um, where the discipline of the human bodies individually and collectively is at the core of German superiority and um, brilliantly uh, in a very dark way Albert Speer conceives of this Cathedral of Light, a nighttime version of the Nure Nuremberg Valley, uh, Nuremberg Rally, where he, against the objections of General Goering, collects all the searchlights they can get their hands on. Over a hundred searchlights collected around the edge of the Zeppelin field to create this illusion of columns extending infinitely into space. And if you've seen the, um, ironically, the uh, World Trade Center uh, towers of light. Uh, it's a direct, again, same formal execution, different meaning. The slippage of meaning, despite the fact that it's the same uh, architectural form. Uh, and you see, uh, here's the new chancellery, uh, the, the marble, uh, the grandiosity uh, of the architectural expression uh, is very much uh, at the core of what Hitler is trying to do. And as the failed architecture student, Hitler is at the core of designing many of the buildings or having a very strong role in the design of these things. Um, here's a sketch uh, by Hitler during his art school days uh, where he was designing an opera house. Uh, in his student days, he actually um, made a living uh, sketching post colored postcards uh, in Vienna. Uh, in one case, reportedly, he, he uh, leaves out Adolf Lohse's Mikkelplatz uh, department store uh, and replaces it with a classical construction. Um, here he is at the um, dec what is it? Not decadent arts, art exhibition. The, the modernist art uh, of the 
of the degenerate. degenerate art, thank you, is collected and um, uh, pulled away from uh, display and, or displayed carefully to demonstrate the decadence uh, and the, um, of, of this modernist tendency. Um, he plays a central role in designing the swastika, one of the most powerful graphic campaigns in human history. Uh, the uniform, the helmet, uh, here it is deployed. He designs, uh, in part, the Volkswagen um, and celebrates it as the car. He, he is one of the first uh, people to successfully uh, deploy a limited access highway, um, proving the dark origins uh, of the freeway system. Um, and here he is even uh, shoveling the dirt. He designed his oratorial presentation through these photographic studies, very carefully constructing how his body language uh, can make a point and, um, and get his message across. And right to the very end, uh, in the bunker with him, when he's found dead, uh, adjacent, to, connected with a, a tunnel, uh, is the model of his hometown, Linz. Uh, his ambition was to rebuild the town. Uh, and so the construction, the reconstruction of the world was very much at the core of what Hitler was trying to do. Um, and then just to connect it uh, quickly with other things, um, Mussolini, early in the fascist uh, movement in Italy, there was an embrace of contemporary architecture which quickly disappeared, as it did, as we saw in Stalin's Soviet Union. Uh, and we're back to where we started with um, uh, Speer's German pavilion and uh, Iofan's Soviet pavilion in the 1937 International Exposition in Paris. Um, and that's all we have time for. Any questions? OK, things will get happier as we move back in time. Thank you.